So good afternoon. My name is Vicki Berry. I'm the director of the OSU Museum of Art. And my colleague Carrie Kim is here. Some of you were here because she she made you come out. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we've been promoting this program. I, I, I was trying to figure out when did we start talking? Uh, in 2016. Right. Yeah. So we've been working on this project for a long time, and it is my pleasure to um, not go on and on stage over and I wanted to introduce uh, the artist team, uh, Marjorie Perret, Robin Lasser, Andrew Shirley. Um, I think you're going to be very intrigued by the work that they do and we're excited. We hope you get excited and think of ideas about how you can be engaged in our project that will go on and on <laughs> <laughs> until uh, its installation in 2021. 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, sorry, we get lost. <laughs> anyway, please welcome um, our team. Thank you. Um, so, I guess what we're going to do today is we're going to give you a little bit of a, a, some background of projects that we work on in the past that we relate in some way to what we're going to be working on in the future here in Oklahoma. And uh, I guess with that, we'll give a little bit of background on our history as well, and I think that's where we'll start with just a little bit on each individual. So, Marguerite? So, I am Marguerite Gray. I am a professor at Washburn University in Topeka, Kansas. I live in Lawrence, Kansas, which is very close. Um, I teach a lot of different kinds of classes, a lot of art practice and theory classes, as well as um, photo imaging and 3D design, and, um, and I'm an installation artist. And I'm the big person there, and Robin Lasser, and I teach, I'm a professor at San Jose State University, and I'm the head of the photo program, but I teach a variety of courses, uh, some of, many of which are photo related, but I also teach the graduate interdisciplinary seminars. I teach a course uh, that I think is pertinent to what we're um, going to address today, and that is the role that artists can play in the 21st century. And I teach courses to uh, graduate students when they want to learn how to become professors, which we call artist teaching art. So I'm excited that you're here today. And my name is uh, Bruce Sherding. Uh, my background has, is uh, for many years uh, has been exhibition planning and design. I worked in Chicago. Museum and the Shedd Aquarium, and then in Iowa and at, at the Biodiversity Institute in Kansas as an exhibit designer and developer. Currently, I'm working at the University of Iowa as a curator, and my uh, the program is called Project Art. It started in the 70s, whose mission is to humanize, at the time the signal was to humanize the medical uh, and healthcare environment. And what that sort of, sort of boils down to is we provide where I go and identify and purchase uh, artwork for the public spaces, program musical performances. We've also done some theater, some writing, and other things. So I see it as, as creating meaningful uh, distractions to take people away from why they're to help reduce stress levels for why they're at the hospital. It's an interesting job. <laughs> And so I think what we'll do is we'll just start by kind of looking at a couple bodies of work and um, we'll just sort of make a few comments on them. So I'll start with the image as you're looking at on your uh, left side. It's a project that we call Dress Tents and uh, there it's in collaboration with Adrian Pau. And we consider these pieces of nomadic wearable architecture. And with this body of work, we bring together fashion from the top. On the bottom, there's always some sort of structure, so the tent part or the architecture. And they're always created to be photographed originally. So she has a mother homeland. In this case, it's the salt uh, fields in Northern California. And if you were to step inside under her skirt, you could experience a workable shower. So when you get out of this salt waters, your skin can be cleansed again. And um, they're meant to be whimsical, but also bring up 
certain environmental issues. Uh, salt can be very detrimental to the landscape. And the image on the right is called Bottled Water. It was part of a larger project that we did in collaboration with the KU Natural History Museum. And the water buffalo, that's a, a mount, that's, that's a trophy mount that was part, donated to the collection. And we situated it in a river of bottled water, referencing the severe drought that has affected South Africa and how the water is still being used commercially and what and how it's being taken out of the environment. So it's inaccessible to the animals and the people. I think the two sources of water that we chose for the bottles were water that was taken out of municipal water supplies and then mm -hmm. refiltered and then sold back to you. Mm -hmm. so, at an average cost. So here's a small collection. Over the last 13 years, we've created 19 uh, dress tent installations. And in this case, like if you look at the one in your upper left hand corner again, um, she is called Ms. Homeland Security. She's the illegal entry dress tent. And uh, she's speaking to the geopolitics of place. So if you look at that fence, that's the border fence between Mexico and the U.S. And the fencing is actually made from the helicopter pads that were used in the Vietnam War. So it's interesting how one set of violence moves on into the next. It, it, it can migrate. Um, this piece, she's called the Ice Queen. She's a glacial retreat dress tent. For, uh, and she's situated in front of one of the few advancing uh, glaciers rather than retreating. And for us, glaciers are the most visible barometer of climate change. So her persona is that of a working worn weather station. So this is a weather balloon and we attach all kinds of instruments to it so that um, when you enter the inside of the tent, you're um, getting a view of uh, where she's installed. And you see here um, a sound piece. So I'm just gonna take a half a second to tell you what that sound is. We like to think of um, climate change as also weather shifts over time from the Industrial Revolution <coughs> to the present. So we graphed every week in that, and then we worked with crickets. And it turns out crickets are natural thermometers. <laughs> One minute, divide by four, 68 degrees, right? So when you enter inside the tent, Early on, closer to the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, their sound is very low, almost like that of a whale sound. And then we work with climatologists who predict the weather shifts into the future. And so when we get to 20 years from now, the cricket sound is like So when you walk inside, you don't realize it, but you're really taking part in this fuller narrative. Okay, this is the edible garden dress tent, and she was created for an artist residency and art center in Saratoga, California. And she's a, she's a gardener, so we started with grasses on the ground, but the grasses that were growing there um, are not very uh, uh, drought resistant, so we decided to pull up the grass and instead plant, could you go back to the previous slide for a second? And then we planted this entire garden with edible vegetables. And those vegetables were used by the uh, chef in residence for the artist for salads every night. And the other thing that happens in Montavo is a place where people get married. So there's the romance of that. There's the romance of being an artist in residence. So when you step inside the tent, you sit on a swing, you swing, you overlook the huge um, villa and the grounds, and then you work with local bird sounds and um, human uh, sounds, uh, music that, that celebrates love. So you, you hear the local birds twerking to each other and then, want to get down. So they're the mixing of the two. That's the song. So as you mentioned too, if you have any questions, just feel free to speak. 
Um, this piece is called uh, uh, Niche, Nature Morte in the Simulated Garden. And all of the elements that are part of the design are taken from the collections at the Natural History Museum at the University of Kansas. And this is when you are first walking in. This particular building had an outer room that was used for presentations. And there's actually screens behind the curtains that so the curtains would be pulled back when there was a presentation taking place. <clears throat> but then you walk through the doors, and there's an apse, which is a circular formation with windows all the way around it. So what we did is we designed faux glass windows, which you can see through the entry here. And then the curtains themselves tell a story. Um, each of these vignettes is from the very famous historic panorama, um, di diorama, that's situated at the University of Kansas. And it's from the beginning of the 20th century. And so it's depicting different ecosystems in the United States as they were at that time. And so we took those and then we strangled them with these developments. These are all aerial views that we took from an airplane that a friend um, flew us over the developments. <clears throat> so it so tracked from South America up to the Arctic as far as mm -hmm. the, the... So yeah, North American. And then um, here in America, every specimen becomes a relic, as a quote from Susan Sontag, who's a very famous art theorist. Um, and she was speaking to the fact that we consume nature and use it up. And so then each of these um, faux glass windows deals with a um, different aspect of species that are primarily or only uh, existing in collections and are endangered or already extinct. And this particular group, um, which you see when you first walk in this space, deals with the tree of life, or is it the tree of life? Um, that's actually Darwin's tree of life, which, is, which, ex which he basically used to kind of, in his own mind, work out the principle of natural selection. And he wrote, I think, because you know, he's a little bit questioning himself, and then, uh, again, the cul-de-sacs becoming a tree, and then the electrical um, towers becoming a tree. So uh, now I'm going to share with you a work that we did as a collaborative team. And this piece is called Floating World, and it was created for a Biennale, which is called Zero One in San Jose, <coughs> California. And it was also a commission by the public arts uh, commissioners um, in, in San Jose. And we chose this site because we thought it was a fascinating ecosystem when looking at migration. So this is the Guadalupe River, and that river often floods. Above the river is a, is a street, but also the walkway, and it's the walkway every single person who takes a train in to San Jose has to um, transgress or trans... <laughs> well, I don't know if they're transgressing to do that. They're, they're <laughs> a little bit. moving from one place to another. And um, above that is, a, is another freeway. So we thought it was a really interesting location to think about the complicated relationships we have uh, with humans and animals and insects. And, and it's also um, Adobe um, headquarters is right there on the other side of the bridge. So this is um, one of our initial uh, concept trends, where we were thinking about how we could cantilever a project over the river. So instead of having it actually on the bridge, it reaches out over the river. And we're thinking of this idea of displaced human and bird song, because, uh, because of the built environment, it's been difficult for the, the indigenous um, birds and invertebrates and to, to maintain a presence in this river. Um, and also, they're built on these stilts because this river has flooded historically several times, um, flooding whole neighborhoods, and so now it's very contained. And even, even at this, it still has flooding events. So what we're looking here at um, models based on uh, emergency relief tents. And each one of the tents, their, their bird size, uh, is lit. So when you walk at night from the train station into the city, it's creating a safe 
safer environment because now it's a, a well-lit environment. And also, each one of these uh, birdhouse encampments contains a, a speaker. But people didn't really know if there was a speaker in that or not. So when you walked across the bridge, you learned about the history and the health of the Guadalupe River as shared by locals, those um, who were interested in the science of the river, that kind of thing. And you had a Nobel Prize winning scientist to uh, contribute. So we can talk about that and then <laughs> Well, and then, the, then we had to also deal with the reality. So <clears throat> we were doing a public art piece, which meant we had to take into account public safety, which meant we also had to work, because this is a very complicated space, we had to work with the train transit authority, the highway authority, and the waterways authorities to get permission to place this artwork on this bridge. And because of that, we were required to work with a certified welder uh, to, to weld this structure together in a specific way uh, so that somebody that weighed 250 pounds could crawl out onto this and, and act out in ways that we, we don't want them to. So, in addition to that, we put a little strip on the top uh, to make it difficult for people to get a grip or to get out onto this structure. So that reality modified the design quite a bit. Uh, we also had to figure out how to run all the electrical for the lighting and for the sonic pieces and into the tent structure so that Boomar became the uh, electrical gateway as well. So this is the actual piece, the one you saw just before this at night. That was still a concept, right? This is the actual piece. Uh, maybe when you go to the next slide, I'll, I'll be able to add something. So, so this was uh, a beautiful environment also for sound because if you ever gone in like into a tunnel, everything reverberates. Mm -hmm. So you really felt like you were surrounded. enveloped and surrounded by the sounds. And this is looking from below. Also, a group of um, who would have otherwise been homeless used the bridge for their home and their shelter that night. And it's also a walking park. And it's also yeah, it's, it's a recreational, recreational area, recreational. Area. Has multi, had a lot of different constituencies using the space. And each one of these encampments um, embraced another idea around uh, water use issues. And for instance, the one on the bottom there, uh, we had the local riparian bird sounds emanating from that tent. But it turns out that anthropogenic noise, anthropogenic means human-induced noise, um, and the noise was coming from the freeway, it was coming from airplanes going overhead. And what happens is the local birds were having to adapt their bird song in, in order to survive. You know, honey, where are you? One bird is saying to another, and if they can't hear each other, they can't have little baby birds, and uh, that's a discontinuation of their life. So what we did is we put a mic in as a sound sensor. And when the level of anthropogenic noise got high enough, it actually shifted the bird song. So you don't realize you're learning information like this. You're taking it in intuitively. But we're always building science and history and theory and story uh, sharing in what we create. So the other part about this is that quite a few people put this together. We had a couple, two, couple different programmers uh, several people helping us with the fabrication work. We actually had to contract that work out to a certified builder. Um, and, and then we, as you can see, we had uh, uh, police assistance to make sure that we were, uh, as we were installing these pieces onto the, onto the bridge. And the other thing that we did, recognizing that we had these people living under the bridge uh, that was their home, we programmed the, the music and the stories and the uh, light, well, the light stayed on, um, and, and stayed on, and, and uh, but we took out all the sound uh, so that there wasn't that sound overnight, mm -hmm. and then it would reboot again in the morning. Uh, and we hit the computer under the um, the walkway here, which is about 30 feet, you know, from the bottom of the river, so that nobody could get in and mess with it. So those are the kinds of things you have to consider when you're working. So um, then 
just more recently, um, Robin and I did a project about um, ponds um, that are being reclaimed, um, um, re re reclamated um, in, in California. And so we started in San Francisco and we moved out toward, we moved east. Um, so um, this is a pond that's in a cemetery that is in San Francisco. Uh, Oakland, actually. And then this is Mono Lake, which is a really famous um, salt water lake that's um, further east. With and an interesting story, too. Yes. Though. You see these two us? Yeah. 20 years ago, these magnificent tufas, you know, grew and spired out of the ground. They looked like they were 20, 30 feet high, which was beautiful. But there's a devastating story behind that because what happens is the waters were diverted down to Southern California. The water um, at, at this lake at this lake completely dropped, which changed the whole ecosystem, right? So in a way, when um, Marguerite and I are going back, we're celebrating that history, which has been reversed. And I, I think um, many of you are artists, and it's the what I'd like to share with you now is the power we can have as artists to affect social change, right? So here's a story where there were photographers who spent, you know, some of them their whole lifetime photographing this place that they love and fighting to get the water rights shifted so that the level could rise up and the ecosystem um, is going towards a balance at this point. The other nice thing about this project, it gave a second life to the tent. So mm -hmm. there was another purpose, another way that these could be used. It's carrying a similar message or uh, along the same line of the ecology and environment. So you can really see the toothless in this um, instance here. So actually, the way these are formed, they're formed under water, and they never break the surface of water. So the fact that you can see them shows that this is in an altered environment. Um, and then in the previous one, we, we, we had some of the little brine shrimp. Um, it's a really interesting ecosystem where there's uh, basically the brine shrimp and birds and um, some uh, saltwater flies are basically everything that grows here and lives here. But what started to happen when the water dipped down, um, land animals, predators, were able to get to the rookeries where the birds were breeding and that really reduced their numbers. So it's gone up and the birds are making a comeback. So that's a really good thing. When did it get reversed? Um, it's, when did it start? I mean, actually we have this information, but... Um, <laughs> yeah, we want to give you uh, yeah. this information, but about 10 years ago, mm -hmm. the water level started uh, rising again, yeah. and it's still in that trajectory. Mm -hmm. and they're not, it's not back to where no, it should No, obviously, because you can still see the two of them. This was in 2017, so. Yeah. The, the project. I'm going to take a wild guess and say in 2007, but I'm making it up. <laughs> but it's somewhere around. There were lawsuits for years about that. Um, so here's the project that we're working on right now um, for the museum in collaboration with all the researchers and students and community members in Stillwater and Oklahoma. So it's very, we're reaching out very, very broadly. And it's called the state we're in because the word state, we are in a state, it's called Oklahoma. Um, but um, it has multiple meanings. It also means the condition of a person or thing, the condition of matter. So water can be a liquid, it can be a solid, it can be a gas. Um, it can also deal with um, you know, a particular condition of mind or feeling. So we're trying to bring all of these meanings into this project. So um, we're also thinking about sense of place. And so water is a big determinant in how you create sense of place. First of all, you can't live without water. Um, you can't grow food without water. So you have to have a water source, and that's usually why you see um, cities and um, settlements around water, because you need it. But um, also, just having water for your, um, it, it, it uh, carves the land, it sculpts the land, um, and the quality of water affects everything. Um, 
people will spend time by the water, relaxing, so it really creates this incredible sense of place. And do you know that, I believe we've got a water specialist here, so now I'm nervous, but I think <laughs> almost all, if not all, the lakes in this particular state have been human created. Is that correct? The majority. The ma okay, so the majority of them. Mm -hmm. And you know that there's more shorelines, I think, uh, than the whole Atlantic coast and the Gulf of Mexico. This is the rumor I've heard. Um, if you were to follow this, measure out all the, the coastal. So you have lots of water here. Mm -hmm. You have a, a huge, dense watershed. Um, so the Anthropocene is this idea that has become very um, accepted that uh, human impact on the natural systems on the earth are, are happening and that, um, so the anthro of course means human. Um, so we're in a new era of, of um, the geologic um, history um, of the world because we are, we are the thing that's impacting the earth systems. And it takes me back to the, this quote by Aldo Leopold. In 1949, he wrote this, but I think it's just something that just stands um, clearly uh, still important. A thing is right only when it tends to preserve the integrity, stability, and beauty of the community. And the community includes the soil, water, fauna, and flora, as well as the people. I think it's such an important concept to think holistically. So um, Anthropocene indicators, how we know, like this is like, or you know, ways that we think about how this is happening. So increasing human population, water in terms of uh, availability, where it's falling, uh, distribution, uh, quality, land system changes, connectivity, loss of that biodiversity, and actually pollution. All of these, actually, all of these fold back into water too. So water really encompasses quite a bit. So we're, we're looking for collaborators and people who are interested in working with us. And um, these are all the different areas that we are looking at. Uh, food production, environmental human health, energy, uh, you know, literature, performing arts, visual arts, uh, built environment, and, and on and on and on. We have a very, we're casting a very broad net. Uh, so thinking about Oklahoma, um, we're asking people while we're here, we've been meeting with a lot of research faculty and people in the community, and we're asking people here what we need to know about water and climate change in terms of how it affects Oklahoma, how um, things that are happening in Oklahoma affect the global system, because uh, it is a system. It's a, you, you can't contain water, it moves. And weather. So, um, except in still water. Yeah, yeah. Because it's very still in still water. <laughs> it doesn't move. You want me to do this one? Me? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, here we are, and this is a prototype. And we call it like a proof of an idea. And uh, in one of the uh, main rooms in the museum, we're going to create, uh, in collaboration, um, with the architecture department, uh, a ramp, a walkway, a dock, a viewing station. You know, have you ever gone out into the wetlands and you walk on the wooden things to keep you from trampling the land? And um, So we're using that as a trope. And then we'll have water, different kinds of water, slowly making its way up and down um, this structure. And then you, too, become enveloped with water as sea levels rise and floods happen. And then, we're, uh, and then the idea is there's a viewing station. And the viewing station is really a way to focus our attention, to allow each one of us to take a moment to stand there to meditate on our own relationships with water. And then we're hoping that all of you are going to share some of your own stories about water. And then we're going to carve those stories into this structure so that it becomes like a living text of all of our stories about water here in Oklahoma, Oklahoma in the greater 
U.S. and the U.S. in relationship to its global position. And um, the video that's going to be projected is going to be video mapped. So um, it will respond to, um, we're going to have a way that people can actually answer a couple of questions in, you know, as they're coming into the gallery. And it will respond to those answers. And it will change the video. The video will respond to that. So either maybe the water will contract or it will get, it will rise, or there'll be some, some language that you typed in that will show up um, on the walls. And you'll go in and say, oh my gosh, I just typed that. So we're hoping that that will absolutely be in real time. But um, people who come in, they'll be contributing to what's happening in the video. So that's going to be like water that's constantly changing. A river of stories. Yeah. So here's some of the um, inspiration. This, this is all at Yellowstone. The National Park System utilizes these quite a bit. And again, it like, kind of focuses your attention. It stills you. Um, and it helps you kind of contemplate where you are and what you're looking at and experiencing. So some of the things about this, too, is the idea is, is what is your outlook? And also this idea that it's a platform uh, on which to stand and view something. And it's also a platform from which people can speak yes. and share ideas and perspectives and ways of looking at water. Because as we've gone around the last day and a half, we've heard so many different people, how they how they look at water, how they how they experience water, how they study water, what are the issues that they see in relation to the future, or to contemporary use and future uses and needs for the communities of Oklahoma. So there's a lot of uh, potential things to, to, um, to provide a platform for. Uh, then we're also looking for ways to maybe uh, create other ways that people might be able to share their own personal um, water stories yeah, yes. or narratives, and that might be through some type of social media uh, portal or something like that, because we've all have I'm sure many, many interesting yeah. images of, of water in various states. And where are we? I think you're going the wrong direction. Yeah. You've been there. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay, another, another space that we're looking at, and again, this is just a very broadly kind of put together concept image. It's change a lot. But um, a project called the Entangled Bank, and the Entangled Bank is from a quote by Darwin, and it's referencing the, uh, from the origin of species, um, and it's referencing his thoughts in a very poetic way, which you wouldn't expect from it. Like some people say, oh, it's a scientist, and it's very poetic, but he was actually a really good writer. And it's um, referencing how natural selection works. So this will deal with, um, this section will deal with biodiversity along river banks, the banks of, you know, uh, lake shores. Um, and what's happening um, to the native species um, and, and the quality of water and how that's affected them. So now this is looks really dark and it's a, just a drop-in piece. It's yeah. not really what it's going to look like. Yeah. And one of the things that, and then at this point everyone starts to get uh, kind of heavy and down. And ultimately I think what we're trying to look at and trying to pull forward and what we see from a lot of the people that we've talked to are these are these really neat solutions for solving problems. Mm -hmm. And they've got sort of narrow things that they're working on and they're solving those problems. And I think collectively, we're looking for those sort of success stories, uh, those sort of opportunities that say, okay, well, this is a problem, but here's how we can utilize that, we did that, pro that outcome to produce something more productive. And so thinking about it less than this big problem, yeah, looking at all the smaller problems that can be solved. So ultimately, we're looking for those types of, of stories as well, to kind of chip mm -hmm. away at the bigger problem. Um, and then here's some, um, these are cast porcelain pieces of, you know, obviously uh, water bottles, you know, one of the main contaminants in water systems. And um, you know, kind of taking that idea of they're becoming uh, part of the environment, they're being utilized by uh, microbes, and there's also this idea of microbes that can eat plastic. So kind of just, uh, there'll be a, uh, some discussion of some of those issues as well. Have you ever seen Chris Jordan's 
photograph and uh, birds that have been deceased, they do an autopsy on them. Albatross. Yeah, and then inside you just see their entire system is just filled with plastic. Yes, that happens to a, a lot of species right there that are especially ocean species. Well, that one's incredibly um, um, important because they, these are birds that live on an island that haven't been visited or, or have restricted human visitation, I think since 1911. And still these birds are ingesting all this plastic because it's out there floating on the surface. They bring it back to their brood, they feed it to the brood, and, and they, they, so they are literally just sort of starving to them because they're, they're getting plastic instead of... Well, and something that you might not um, notice, because you wouldn't notice this, but um, microplastics. Plastic doesn't go away, it just gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And so microplastics are becoming part of the food chain uh, because of a lot of the, uh, the microbes are eating them, and, uh, but they're not digesting them, and then the fish eat the microbes, and fish also eat some of this stuff. You are eating plastic. You have plastic in you right now because it's part of the food chain now. That's nice, right? <laughs> you are what you eat. You know, plastic. Oh, okay, so um, the, and the, the final, well, there's two more projects that we're looking at. One is to work with uh, the wastewater treatment plant here in Stillwater. Um, Robin and I, originally we met um, going to wastewater treatment plants. Like, we were the people who enjoyed doing that. Uh, I know, it's just like crazy. Uh, but we thought it was so cool. Um, so uh, we've been to um, some in California and Colorado, and we want to work with the plant here, and the person who's in charge of that is really excited about that. And uh, what we love about wastewater, it's something that has been used and can be reclaimed in very positive ways. So um, this is in um, Hayward Marsh, which is in Hayward, California, which is near San Francisco. And um, this, is a, this is a tertiary treatment for wastewater. And what it's been doing is by putting this water that has been treated that needs additional treatment into the environment and creating a wetlands, it's created a whole um, an ecosystem that's supporting migratory birds that people have not seen in this area for a very long time. And now they're coming back and they're reclaiming this area. So it's been very, very successful. And that's wastewater. And it's also continuing to filter the wastewater mm -hmm. before it goes into the sea. That's, that's what a wetlands uh, does. Um, so uh, we're also playing with this idea that wastewater, you know, when you flush your toilet or do your laundry, that's all wastewater. Um, wastewater is us. So when it ends up in the treatment plant, it's the community. It's like everybody contributes to it. And we all have a stake in making sure that we cleanse that water and take it back in a, in a different way to the, back into the environment. Um, so we thinking about this idea of a Greek ode, which is um, a three-part um, presentation with a chorus. And a lot of wastewater treatment is a three-part uh, treatment process. And so creating like some kind of uh, event with a chorus at the wastewater treatment plant. So the idea behind that not only is to celebrate information mm -hmm. through the voice once again, but to bring those of us from the community, like how many in here have ever been to a wastewater treatment plant? Cool. All right. Well, the rest of you who haven't gone, we have been, you know, hopefully this kind of project brings you out there, right? And they do tours, and they're really happy to arrange that. And we're also interested in creative placemaking. Mm -hmm. So creating art that calls attention to something iconic like a wastewater treatment plant. So uh, this is from Snowmass, Colorado. And uh, it's a video, which we didn't bring the video with us because you know, it's, it takes a lot of time. And the presentation we had earlier, we had to kind of move more quickly. But uh, it takes you from, there's, there's the sludge, where you know, it's the dirtiest water. And some of the microbes that help break that sludge down. And then it gets cleaner and cleaner. And then this is um, uh, one of the clarifying ponds that's associated with 
that treatment plant, and then of course it evaporates and goes into the clouds and goes somewhere else. And then the rains come down <laughs> and the cycle continues. And then the final project that we're looking at that uh, we're really interested in is Sienna, Sienna bacteria or blue-green algae. And um, so Sienna bacteria is a photosynthesizing bacteria. So it's like a plant, but it's not a plant, it's a bacteria. And um, there's many different species. Um, a few years ago, there was a bloom in the Kaw Lake, mm -hmm. and it created a lot of problems because it um, can create, um, it can make people sick, um, it smells bad, um, there were boiled water issues that year, and this happens frequently because of heat and nutrients that get in the water from, you know, from runoff, different kinds of runoff. Um, so it is a problem. So, um, but there's also a good side to cyanobacteria. So different species, well, here's the bad part. So yeah, it kills fish. Um, it, it, it gets really mucky like that. Um, but there's different species, like this is uh, spirulina, which is actually a saltwater um, type of cyanobacteria. That can be, it's a high protein, and very nutrient it has high nutrient value, and actually somebody here on campus is studying this as a food source and um, working through how that could happen. So that's really interesting. Protein, like you could put it in your, you know, uh, fruit shake, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, there's also uh, species that could be used to clarify wastewater because um, it'll capture, it'll it'll digest um, the the um, parts of the wastewater you're trying to take out, and then you can take that back out, and you can turn it into a biofuel. Or there's also, it could be a biofertilizer instead of using a petroleum-based fertilizer. Um, there's also a potential for even some of the more um, destructive or dangerous types of cyanobacteria that create different kinds of toxins, like neurotoxins, liver toxins. Some of those toxins are being identified and they're being looked at as possible medications. For instance, there's one that's being looked at for assisted fibrosis treatment because um, it opens up the lungs, irritates the lungs, but if it's given to the patient in the correct manner, it helps open up the passage, the airway, the air passages. So, there's, so it's not, you know, it's not like this is a bad organism. Cyanobacteria um, is one of the things that actually made the Earth's air breathable. Um, in the, uh, millions and millions of years ago. But it's like everything, yeah. sometimes too much isn't a good thing. Yeah, right. So we're just going to end with this slide. Um, we, we grew uh, some <coughs> kinds of cyanobacteria in some tanks, and we used like the, these modified plastic bottles for um, just visual interest. But uh, these clumps here are different species of cyanobacteria. And this was part of another exhibition we did. And then we um, we took samples out and we, we projected the, um, the, the, through a microscope, we projected some of these images so people could learn more about it and think about it. So in uh, January 2020, uh, the three of us are going to be here for a month and we're opening up two of the gallery spaces as an educational component and it will be like a living laboratory. So one of the things we're going to do is we're going to have a cyanobacteria you know, garden and explore what can be done with that. And we're already working with the other faculty member who's you know uh, considering it as a protein source. So mm -hmm. these are some of the ways that we want to interact. And then perhaps through that laboratory, we come together as a community and think about uh, the creation of visual equivalents um, that can convey that information perhaps emotionally and we'll use a second gallery space to present whatever it is that's created during that month. Uh, we are interested in working with students as well on these projects so um, we would encourage um, people to contact us. Um, we are interested in hearing your ideas and um, if you would like to participate in some way. Can you give them your, you know what, we, we should have the last line. We should go back to that. Yeah, yeah, let's go back to that in case anybody wants to write down our um, email addresses. I think it appears a place with the email address. Yeah, they're all on Those are our email addresses. No, those are our websites. Oh, websites. Well, but you can get your email address from there. Or you just put
put in the name, at least for Marguerite and myself, you replaced the dot com with the uh, Gmail. Um, no, it actually be my first name, oh, dot okay. at Gmail. Or, or if you go to the website, you can also you can you can see some of our other projects, and you, you, there is a contact page there too. Or you can go to because I teach at San Jose State University. You can go to Robin Lasser, the way it's spelled mm -hmm. there, um, at sjsu.edu. So, right, that's pretty much it for today. So if you guys have any questions or any comments. Yes. Oh, I, was, um, I was just wondering how you like keep track of the ways that your projects have like made a difference in the various like, places that you install them. So in some, uh, we've done a number of different types of projects, and a lot of our projects have been about art and health. And so we do workshops and work with. Uh, we have we usually have a workshop component that goes along with those, and oftentimes uh, what we. We don't really have hard data, but we get responses back from the gallery director and sometimes from people that have gone to the exhibits uh, will contact us directly. Uh, but we will hear things back from the director how this how this exhibit has had an impact on, because oftentimes we show university settings, uh, how this may have had an impact on a certain uh, population uh, of the university. And in a number of these projects, we've also had what we sort of call uh, public public um, um, messaging, which is there's opportunities within the context of an exhibit to write and respond to that exhibit. So just to give one example, one of the uh, projects that we worked on was on domestic violence. And in that exhibit setting, there was a, a, a bed uh, that had been stripped down to the wood and to the box curtains. And off to the side was a table that had little index cards that people could write comments and, and stories on. So we limited it to an index card hoping to help focus and, and, and you know, make the, the point, help people make the point quickly. And they would then take those and then and attach those to the bed. And we would collect those. And then we would document those stories and some of them we put into other texts. Um, others we wanted to create an archive, we just sort of run out of time for some of these things, but we still have them. So we're still looking for a way to, to kind of incorporate it. Sometimes there's even a more direct um, response. Um, you know, with the, with the healthcare thing, just for a second, um, we, we showed some of that work at a women's college in Minnesota. And um, one of the things that we were talking about was eating disorders. And so um, the students said, wait a minute, why don't we, we didn't even have like any special counseling or support group for people with eating disorders. And so they, 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 they forced the, that issue and they were able to have one started based on our project. And sometimes, you know, on that topic uh, that I also worked with, uh, before I met you, otherwise I would have uh, shared it with you. You know, we would have people come up to us and say, you know, I think this exhibition may have saved my life. Because they might not have even recognized the conditioning that they, the condition that they were experiencing. So, and even in the case of like the real world situation, like floating world when it's out in the public, uh, the homeless that lived under the bridge really were the museum guards. Mm -hmm. They really protected the people. They sort of took ownership of it. Yes. They really thought of it as their own, and they were incredibly upset when the city when it came time to take it down. Because it was a temporary public art project, so um, yeah, they they were like, "Who's taking our art?" Yeah. And we're, we're like, "Well, we're sorry, it's just like the end of the time for this." And like, "Well, I'm going to go complaining." <laughs> <laughs> it was only supposed to be up for six months, and I think it ended up being a year. Yeah, it was uh, over three years. It was three years. But even the piece that we did at Montelay, because we were there um, photographing for a couple of days, um, there were different tourist groups that would come by and they would talk to us. They were from all over the world. And so they would ask questions about why are you doing this? And um, you know, one, one group from Germany um, said, why are you doing this? This is a, for an advertisement. And they said, well, yeah, in a way, because we're trying to raise awareness about how the recreational use of some places that are fragile like this 
can be beneficial because then people start to care about them and people really cared about Harmony Lane because they were going to it and utilizing it. And so he said, oh, you know, he said, that makes perfect sense. And it's like he was getting it. And so um, we have a lot of interaction with people directly and indirectly through these projects. Good question, and it's a challenging one, and I think it's actually sort of, would be, I mean, I feel like it's a, it's, would be better, we would serve ourselves better, I think, by doing better documentation. It's just that it's, it's, it's another job. Yeah. Well, the thing for do. the arts is there's qualitative versus quantitative mm -hmm. assessment mm -hmm. processes, and often with the arts, it's the qualitative process mm -hmm. that makes some sense. Yeah. yeah. And just finally, I'll just give one more example. Um, recently I went to Paraguay and we did a project there with a hospital there. And um, in Paraguay is a pretty poor country. And the hospital situation for people who can't afford private care is um, it's, it's pretty dismal. You go to the hospital, you're going to have surgery weeks, you know, maybe a week in advance, maybe two weeks in advance, and you have to be there the whole time. And there's no place to be. People don't have money to go stay in the hotel. So they're living in the hallways. And we did a project there where we engaged them in an art project. And it just, like, everybody at the hospital, all the doctors were like, this is amazing. I can't believe how much this is benefiting. People wrote their stories on uh, some pieces that they made and told, you know, why they were there. And they were just so relieved to have something creative to do. And then also in this hospital, there was no art. It was all kind of like um, tile and it was all green and white. And um, so we put all this in the space and it, just having color in the space made a tremendous difference. And they've contacted us several times since then, and we've been in conversation with them, telling them how they can continue this project. So one of the things we like to do is when we go in and work with a community, how can we create an environment where uh, the ideas that are embraced in, in what we're uh, exploring together have a chance to continue? Right, so that you know, once the individual artists leave a situation, how do all of you, for instance, keep keep some of these ideas that we're engaging with going? Right, so it becomes generative, like a snowball going down the mountain. Becomes. So one thing is um, the platform we're going to build is going to go to the Botanic Garden after the exhibit in the museum, and it will have all the stories on it. And we're going to um, figure out some way that it can continue to be um, generative and, and collect more, <coughs> like be, be more participatory. And we had a really wonderful meeting with the director of the Botanic Garden, and he was very excited about it. So if you haven't cool. gone out there, go out there. It's such an incredible, peaceful mm -hmm. place, and it's like the world of like the mad scientists out there, you know. Uh, and then you go, and it's almost like uh, going on an archaeological dig because some are, you know, in um, constant use right now. Others have had their time, but they leave the remnants. And it's just beautiful, the weaving of all the creativity that makes that space. Questions? Or comments yet? Yeah. I actually wondered if you could talk about the materials that you use mm -hmm. and in going in, how you kind of reconcile what's needed for the materials needed for like longevity, yeah. if that is a concern, and how to reconcile that with um, environmentally friendly. Mm -hmm. That is a challenge and actually repurposing things is a challenge too because when you're building a piece for one context, it does take a lot of effort to try to figure out how to place it into another context. So originally when we were thinking about the design for the platform, we were thinking of, of uh, recycled, re recycled materials. Uh, so thinking about uh, plastic uh, decking uh, materials, things that will up well to water the environment. Um, not sure how that will translate because as we've been talking with other people and how to put this graffiti and other writing into the deck, I'm not sure how, and I we would have to do some more research, I'm not sure how uh, those that equipment will interact with that material because it's going to be, you know, what you, you know, I don't know how a waste it will, uh, will work with that type of material. So another solution
solution might be to use the materials that are common to the process and then uh, figure out a coating that would seal that material and help extend the life of that. After all, the wooden decks are out there in our backyards all over <laughs> this country. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. So it might be just simply moving from plastic recycling <coughs> to uh, uh, sustainable wood, wood, wood that's yeah. designed for out outdoor environments. I mean, that was this initiative in making arms, which I mean, um, you know, we, we, you know, if you're using technology, you say, oh, I'm not using like a lot of materials, but the technology has a lot of toxic components. And if you could just update your computers every once in a while and change something out on them, and you can't, you have to take it back and get, you have to hope that somehow somebody's processing it properly and buy the new computer. So in a consumerist society, sometimes you you are really stuck, and that is that is always an issue. And even like um, some of this, like I I work in lots of different media, um, but some of the porcelain things that I'm making right now, I think well porcelain's not that toxic, but you have to fire it, so it's like the energy that's consumed to do that. So yeah, it is, it is always an issue. But also, you got to consider the amount of bang for your buck, is what I think. And, you know, uh, I think it's really important to be considerate uh, about the environment with uh, all the choices we make. Uh, but, um, you know, when you're doing art productions, the, the amount of impact or negative impact that any one choice may be is probably very minimal when you really consider the collection of both our individual lifestyle choices and you know what how we use energy in our communal systems those are much have much greater impact but I think even as a metaphor it's important to take these things into consideration it is a very difficult thing and it has been for a number of years uh, echo art and other other areas have, have challenged artists to be more responsible in the materials and process uses and it's, it's, it is very challenging like many things in, in our lives and so for yeah so how do you deal with that is, is a but the way. cool thing is now there's eco artists out there for instance if you're a painter they will come to your studio or write to you if they can and make suggestions on how you can clean up your act in that regard right so there's a lot of people out there just like yourselves because you're here, so we assume you care, mm -hmm. right? And so there are resources, and I think, you know, really it's kind of our generation that screwed it up for your generation a little bit. Um, that's unfortunate, sorry, uh, but the, the amazing <laughs> thing is to uh, hear the kind of ideas that you all have for recreating Okay. <laughs> I'm starving. I'm going to go home and thank you for being with us for coming.